World War II was known as the bloodiest war ever fought and had an impact just about everywhere, including here in Fulton. Now, Fultonians have always shown a patriotic spirit during wartime, going as far back as the Civil War when Callaway County became known as the Kingdom of Callaway. But life here in town before the United States entered World War II was a lot like that of any other rural town as the 1940s began. Fulton was a small town and Fulton was a quiet town. The Depression really affected Fulton and there were people that were hungry. We had one grocery store and one clothing store. You go to the theater, I think it cost about a dime to get in, and maybe a nickel for popcorn. And Everybody sat on their porches and visited with each other at night. And a lot of the, some houses there on Porch Street used to have porches that don't now. November 29th, 1941, a Saturday, was a typical weekend a day in Fulton. Many were beginning their Christmas shopping, while others were enjoying the splendors of the annual Santa Claus Parade downtown. However, in only eight days, the lives of everyone in Fulton and the entire country would be changed forever. this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. I can remember when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. It was, everybody was in shock that that, way, that that happened. We were coming home from church on Route F, Central Christian Church, and uh, we got word that Pearl Harbor had been bombed and we got home and I know uh, my mother and dad was pretty upset about that and uh, with four boys. Well, we heard about it from my uncle. We went to church and we, we was going to visit him and Jeff said he, and they said he bombed Pearl Harbor. We were listening to the radio and I heard the announcement that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. My cousin's fiance left immediately because he was an associate editor of the St. Louis Star Times. Other Fultonians such as John Millard was already in the service at Fort Riley, Kansas when he heard the devastating news. We were out on a rifle range taking practice and that ground was as hard as concrete and it was near zero. And all of a sudden, they said, we're all going to load up and go back into camp. We thought, well, that's great. But it wasn't so great when we went to a big auditorium and they had the radio was on and President Roosevelt was saying, we are at war. Then there was Shirley Payne's future husband, Bruce. He was stationed at Pearl Harbor on December 7th and wrote about the ominous scene in his diary. He said, swinging peacefully at the outer buoy at about 745, all hell broke. The following day, many huddled up to their radio sets to listen to President Franklin Roosevelt's response to the Japanese attack. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Others, particularly men 18 years of age and older, were soon preparing for their call to service. The draft started, I got pulled out number three. At that time, I was just out of high school, and uh, the draft was closing in fairly close to me, too, so uh, I had a chance to get in with a uh, radio school, and so I thought the best thing would be to enlist, and uh, that way I could help my country, too. Really, I kind of wanted to go because of I felt like we needed to represent the people. The kids I was in school with, we were too young, and but some of them wanted to go. That was what they wanted to do. And you, you just wondered what was going to happen to everybody. While most were more than willing to head to Europe or the Pacific to fight tyranny and terror, men like Jack McBride were already fighting their own form of tyranny at home in Fulton. Segregation at the time still had a firm grasp across the country and separate but equal was truly anything but the case if you were black. Growing up in Fulton, uh, 
for me and for any black person, it's been a, it's been a challenge. Uh, in grade school, uh, we were all segregated. If we wanted to go to high school after finishing grade school, we had to ride a bus uh, 50 miles a day round trip to uh, Jefferson City. I had uh, no, no access to parks and recreation as we do now. I didn't look forward to being drafted, but I, I, I knew that when I, went, when I met my 18th birthday, I would be drafted, and I was. Men entering the service from Fulton and Callaway County began their trek to war at Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, where physicals were given. For many, it was their first trip outside of mid-Missouri. That was a big deal to, to just go to St. Louis, because I mean, I'd never been there before. And we got on a bus, rode down to Jefferson Barracks, went through the physical that you had to take and all that, and taking your shots and all that to get where you needed to be. I uh, thought I'd sneak by without my glasses, so I left them in the vehicle outside. And they said, well, where's your glasses? And I said, what glasses? And they said, well, you tell me your nose you wear glasses. So I had to go out and get my glasses. Back in, in those days, I was six foot one, and I weighed about 140 pounds. So there was kind of a question whether I might not make it on account of my weight. And after we went through all the physicals down there, they told me, I noticed I was redlined. I asked what the red line meant. The red line, he said, that physically you're in good shape and we're gonna put some weight on you, so you're in. Once soldiers and sailors left Jefferson Barracks, they were sent all across the country for basic training and boot camp, and later, even advanced training. Most of the bases were in places very foreign to the servicemen. Camp Callan, California. Great Lakes, Illinois. Swamps of Louisiana. Farragut, Idaho. Learning the fundamentals of being a soldier, sailor, or Marine is very necessary in assuring their preparedness for war. From shooting a rifle in a field to knowing how to fight fires on ships, the very basics would help keep many servicemen alive. The process of becoming a warrior, however, certainly wasn't easy. Basic training to me was a very rigorous deal. We learned to shoot, which I would never even had a, a rifle in my hand, you might say, by them and learn to shoot and learn to take care of yourself. And it, it was challenging to get through it. My father told me the night before I left, he said, you're gonna be so far from home a year from now, you'll wonder if you're gonna get back. <laughs> he had been in World War I. We had no idea where we'd be going because it was kind of confusing to us having maneuvers in the desert and maneuvers in the swamps. Navy men from the Fulton area were usually assigned to Great Lakes Naval Training Station just north of Chicago for their initial training. Unfortunately for the sailors, the weather they faced was unlike anything they would eventually see in either Europe or the Pacific. Great Lakes in January, if you don't understand, some cold weather. Wow, that air off of those, what, frozen lakes up there or something. Well, I was at Great Lakes during November and December and January, even February and March of 1942 and three. And we had lots of 23 below zero, snowed every day but two or three from Thanksgiving night. And I left there March the 10th and 43, it was still pouring down snow. Everyone at Great Lakes had to contend with the bitter cold temperatures of winter, but Jack McBride and other black soldiers also dealt with the same issues they faced every day as civilians, and in some cases, even worse conditions. Great Lakes Naval Training Station was, was the most segregated place I've ever been. Uh, everything was segregated. Uh, mess halls, canteen, even had separate buses for black sailors and white sailors to ride in. And, uh, but the one good thing about Great Lakes was I got a chance to learn a lot of Great Lakes about what leadership was. Once in the service, there was no telling when one would be able to go back home and visit loved ones, if ever again. But for John Miller and Jack McBride, they found a way to return to Fulton before leaving the United States for points unknown. When we left the desert in California, they had sent a telegram to me at California that my son was born. 
Well, that telegram didn't catch up with me until three days later. I went in and see my commanding officer. He said, get some sleep and I'll let you go home tomorrow. But it's just, just gonna be for three days. So I saw my son when he was a little over three days, four days old. Next time I saw him, he was over two years of age. I wasn't supposed to open my orders, but I did. And it said report to Bunker Hill, California for service on the USS Montreal. I knew that was a big one. So what I did, I went to the ticket office, uh, train off, train station office. I asked if I could reroute that ticket. And I rerouted the ticket all the way from Farragut, Idaho. I had to come to Chicago and all the way to home. I caught the train to St. Louis. I got off the train in St. Louis and had a cab to take me off the highway. And then it was the Interstate 70, but Highway 54. And I will hitchhike home. Once orders were given to go off and fight the war, whether you were in the Army or Navy, whether heading to Europe or the Pacific, there was only one way to get there, and that was by boat. We didn't know what, how we'd be going except by boat. And we left at night and went up a long ramp, a walking ramp to go up. And I thought, my goodness, we're going up awfully high. Must be a big ship. It was a big ship, it was the Queen Mary. For the first three days, I was sick. You get it, motion sickness. And I learned from listening to the sailors and all that if you eat something and keep something in your stomach, you can kind of get over it. It's very close quarters, and we had some pretty bad storms and for days at a time. I could stand and hold a rail, and I could have touched the water with my hand and back and forth like that. It's pretty rough living when you're living like that. There was no racial problem on the ship. We had white friends, black friends. While servicemen were getting adjusted to life away from family, everyone at home also had to deal with changes to their daily life. No longer could people buy as much sugar or meat as they wanted or fill up their car as often as needed. We all went on rationing and you had to have things that we've been used to buying you couldn't buy. And things like that that was, even in food lines, you had to have that rationed. The sugar and the hose and things like that. Uh, but we, we, we survived, we made do. We had enough to eat, but it might not be what we really wanted. If you had a ration stamp, you could buy so much sugar, but then if they ran out, you couldn't buy more. A bunch of my friends and I, we gathered their metal, and we, we got a whole lot, and we put it up in front of the high school, where I went, that'd be the old high school up there on 10th, and put it there in front, and we never told anybody that we were the ones that did it. A chance of war eventually being fought on the doorsteps of Fulton was always extremely remote. Still, residents throughout the city always had to be prepared for surprise encounters with the enemy. During the war, we'd have nights when there would be sirens and every light in town had to go off. And they had a curfew during part of that. I think we had to get off the street at 10 o'clock. Of course, the war had an impact on just about every aspect of everybody's life in Fulton. While some of the consequences of war were difficult to get used to, there were positive results. Once the war started, women could get jobs in the shoe factory or the state hospital. And, and students could work summers. So the, econ the big thing was the economy got better. They came up to the high school when I was in high school and wanted us to work at the shoe factory. And I went and Two or three of my other friends went. We worked at the shoe factory. My mother worked for International Shoe Company, and my stepdad worked for the brick plant. Meanwhile, by 1944 in Europe, American forces were busy working towards a plan to invade France. At the time, most soldiers were based in Great Britain waiting for orders. Their location was far enough away from the front lines, but not nearly far enough away from being attacked by German U-boats and the Luftwaffe. We uh, were 
heading toward Slappin' Sands. And uh, in that particular evening, uh, which was the 28th, uh, my outfit, who were, we were joined with the engineer brigade, and uh, we had already gotten off of the big ship and went to shore and uh, made our initial landings. And then through the night, three or, I think it was three or four German e-boats got into the convoy that we were in. We lost over 700 people. And uh, the, uh, they sunk two of the LSTs and one was crippled and made it back to England. And uh, so uh, nobody knew anything about that. Finally, on June 6, 1944, the Allied forces crossed the English Channel to engage face to face with the Nazis near Normandy, France. The largest cluster of soldiers, approximately 50,000, stormed Omaha Beach. This area was also the most heavily fortified area with its high bluffs and resulted in 5,000 American deaths. Leonard Bruns was part of the D-Day mission and landed on Utah Beach, the westernmost beachhead and one which suffered the least amount of casualties. At uh, about seven o'clock or so, we were nearing we were nearing the shore, and uh, then uh, we were getting prepared to, to land, and so we uh, got our LST or LCT shoved up onto the beach. But uh, at that time, the Germans had all these tripod obstacles on the beach and we came in at high tide and we got hung up on one of those so we were about a hundred yards from the shore and we were in about 10 or 20 foot of water so uh, then uh, they sent out a couple sailors to put ropes out and I think two sailors drowned in that operation and then finally they got a rope secured and we had we jumped off and got over to shore shelling was pretty heavy at that time so we landed up against the um, the uh, seawall and so our sergeant got us all together and our job was to keep all communications from ship to shore to infantry. Halfway around the world, life was no less dangerous at sea for U.S. sailors. And it wasn't always the Japanese the men in white had to watch out for on ship. My job was to put the powder can in and as it was fired, to catch it on the way out, I had asbestos gloves clear to my shoulders because they can't, those casings came out of the red hot. And my job was to guide it through a hole in the bottom of the gun turret and they would go down to the very bottom of the ship and be stored down there until we got back to the States. The only time I had a fear was, where my, was when I was at my battle station. And even though I was part of an engineering group, my battle station, my first battle station was in a, a 40 millimeter magazine. And when you went into that magazine, they dropped an eight inch steel hatch down and you could not open it. I mean, if the ship went down, you went with it. Easter Sunday, 1945, uh, we were in the South China Sea heading, uh, thought we were going to join the convoy, heading to uh, Japan. And all at once, general quarters sounded, all hands man your battle station, all hand man your battle station. We said, what in the world? And what happened was a lone Japanese plane had come in from the north. And they said later he dropped a lot of tin foil, it messed up our radar, and a Japanese uh, some Japanese plane hit us from the south. We went to Okinawa. We were landed uh, D-Day morning, the 14th Marines on Purple Beach 1. There was 267 kamikazes, according to intelligence, coming down on us at that time in a total of uh, 3,091 days. We either shot them down or they crashed on ships or crashed in the water. I watched several hundred Japanese pilots that missed ships uh, drowned. Last thing you would see is a plane was sinking with his helmet on his head. 
and that would be the last thing you'd see. Despite being focused on defeating Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, the servicemen couldn't help but think about loved ones back home in Fulton, and any chance the riots will receive letters was something that easily tugged at their emotions. Myself and my friends, we wrote to guys that were from this area that were in service. It was really exciting, it was all so sad because you'd wish so much you was with them. But it turned out okay. I didn't have near the hardships that so many had. The thing is, you really didn't know where they were. You only could send out letters if you were going to rendezvous or stop, if, if the convoy was going to stop at some island where it could get off. That island had to have resources where they had flights out. It was pretty slow because when I found out about my brother in Saipan being lost, I think he had been gone then about two weeks. Residents of Fulton, meanwhile, did have a chance to see the enemy up close and personal. Italian prisoners of war were stationed at a camp on the south side of town. Some of the buildings still remain standing and in use today. We had this place out there that used to be to teach kids to work and things, and that had closed, so they made the one building, which is now the VFW, that wasn't that quite that big then, and that was Teen Town. And the school bus would pick us up on the corner of the courthouse and the old 54, on business 54. And we would get on the bus and go out there, and then we'd go out the door on the north and, north and talk to the Italian prisoners of war. In Europe, the Allied forces were quickly forcing the Nazis back into Germany and severely lessening their strength. During the Germans' retreat, they sabotaged anything that would be beneficial to the Allies, but they didn't quite cause enough damage that soldiers such as Leonard Bruns couldn't fix. We found that the Germans had an underground uh, cable system, and so we got into that and found that a lot of the manholes weren't harmed, and a lot of them they had went through and, and uh, dropped uh, hand grenades in them and tore up the cables inside. But so we had people that could get in there and uh, start splicing some of that stuff together. And uh, we finally got a pretty good uh, underground communication between uh, our beach all the way to Paris. All of the bridges across the Rhine River supposedly had been blown months before and was none of them left. And we approached the Rhine, got to Remagen, Germany. There was a bridge. And of course, our units grabbed that real quick. And uh, it, was, it was set up to be blown, but for some reason they captured the enemy before they could blow it. And they cut all the wires, and it was a railroad bridge, what it was, but our engineers planked it down pretty quickly so we could drive vehicles across. And naturally the Germans then wanted to blow that bridge so they kept trying to approach it with their planes and drop bombs on it. The lives of soldiers in Europe were anything but glamorous and nothing like what was portrayed in recruiting posters at the time. Even such a daily routine as sleeping wasn't always easy. When we were in France, it was just sleep where you could and when you could. But we got to Luxembourg the people were more accommodating. I stayed with the mayor, had a little stucco home. After we left Luxembourg and got into Germany, which was our enemy, we didn't sleep outside anymore. We'd take over a small town and we'd go to the outs, our division would go to the outskirts of the town. We'd take over maybe a whole block of apartment homes or a whole block of homes and we'd go tell the people you've got 15 or 20 minutes to get out. By late April of 1945, the Soviet Union entered the German capital of Berlin. Adolf Hitler, not interested in being taken captured, elected to commit suicide on April 30th. Germany then unconditionally surrendered to the Allies on May 8th. Meanwhile, the war continued in the Pacific as the United States was preparing for an invasion of Japan. But to hardly anyone's knowledge, the U.S. had developed an atomic bomb that had the energy of 13 to 18 kilotons of TNT. 
On August 6th, a B-29 Super Fortress named Enola Gay flew over Hiroshima and dropped the bomb named Little Boy. It was a moment that would change the world forever. When the atomic bomb was dropped, dropped we knew nothing about the atomic bomb being dropped. That was, was all new to us. We didn't know what was going on. You just can't imagine a boy from a small town, a bomb large enough to blow up a whole city and leave it in rubble. I, I just couldn't imagine it. We knew that we were going to have to go again. That done told us to Yokohama and that whenever they invaded it. And when the bomb went off, uh, we were very happy. <laughs> there have been criticism that of the harm it did, but the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and, and that didn't bother me a lick. Surprisingly, the first atomic bomb was not enough for Japan to surrender. So three days later, another atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. With the thoughts of another atomic bomb being dropped on Tokyo and the Soviet Union declaring war on Japan, Emperor Hirohito decided to finally surrender. The terms and conditions upon which surrender of the Japanese imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. Richard White was aboard the USS Pennsylvania at the time, which was anchored in Okinawa. On August 12th, however, a Japanese torpedo plane managed one final attack on White's ship before the war officially came to a close. We got torpedoed 58 hours before the war ended. Uh, they were having an air raid on the other side of Okinawa, and, and this Japanese two-man Betty torpedo bomber flew it around about, he was 50 feet off the ground and we were sitting right in the mouth of the harbor. And he says, oh, I got me a big one. If uh, you were sitting in a chair on your bed and somebody picked it up and dropped it, that's the way it fell. It put a 30 foot hole in, in our, uh, we, had, we had four screws that ran the ship and it blew off three of them. And we lost 30 good men. While White and the rest of his Pennsylvania crew were trying to repair their ship, Japanese officials were preparing to board the USS Missouri to officially sign the terms of their surrender. Still, many servicemen were not totally convinced the war was indeed over. Our captain came on, he said, we, we're not going to believe that until we get more notice, said, you will stay, no celebration, you will stay a alert to your battle stations and all because they lied to us once at Pearl Harbor and said they may be doing it again. To negotiate the uh, surrender, the American forces uh, said you fly a pane painted, painted white with green crosses to Okinawa. And I remember the, the day after we were, or two after we were sitting there trying to keep afloat that I saw that plane fly over. So I knew the war was over. The war was now over and celebrations were occurring all over back home. But that did not mean the jobs of American servicemen were done. Many military units that had been patrolling the Pacific now had to make sure terms of the Japanese surrender were met. We were immediately sent to Japan, our ship was, and we were sent to the northern tip of Japan Hokkaido and Hokkaido, Japan. That's where we docked. They didn't know what would happen when we landed there, you know. But here we landed there right on the docks and walked off the ships and and uh, it, it went smooth, you know. The women were scared of us first, but the men were helped. Some of the men saluted our flags. You're walking guard duty, you didn't have a round of ammunition in your rifle because they knew we were all scared. But the Japanese were walking through the campground and all that too. It was probably a good thing we didn't have any ammunition. It was kind of scary, because you really didn't know. The end of battle, however, meant that the military men could lower their guard a bit, even in occupied Japan, and that meant enjoying some of life's guilty pleasures. I was on a troop train that uh, went to one of the cities there in Japan to get a troop train full of beer, there two railroad cars full of beer, and bring them back for, for the PX as they're in the division. And that's the only time I was over there that I ever had a, a rifle that had any ammunition in it. 
but we were told then, if somebody breaks into that train, shoot, don't ask questions. Protected at all costs. There was two of us. We had two cars, two railroad cars, plumb full of bills. What really got us was, you know, uh, an old, old, older Japanese, two or three of them came up. They were just so nervous. They came up to us, and guess what they asked for? Camel cigarettes. That's right. Did we have camel cigarettes? Who could believe it? People think we had a lot of bad times, but you know, we had some good times there. <laughs> Slowly, life began to return to normal as veterans returned home. Although the military was looking for a few good men to stay in service a little longer. I had an offer from them to re-enlist over there, and I said, my goodness, after this year asked me to re-enlist, I'm going home. We were all glad to get home when I got home. Studebaker had made the new car that looked like you couldn't tell the front from the back, you know? and things like that when I got home that we saw. That was altogether different. You couldn't imagine the changes that we saw when we come back. But not everything changed once back in Fulton. Life for Jack McBride and other black citizens meant returning to a life of segregation. Coming back to segregated Fulton, that was on my mind. I will be frank with you because uh, what, 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 what was I fighting for? When I got back to Fulton, one of the first things I did was to ask my girlfriend, who later became my wife, to go to the movie. She wanted to go to the movie. So we went to the Fulton Theater. And the blacks had to go buy their ticket to the Fulton Theater, buy your ticket, come back out, go down the alley, come upstairs, and see the movie. You couldn't go sit down. Good or bad, Fultonians moved on with their lives, and as the decades came and went, the events of World War II slowly faded away. There wasn't even a memorial dedicated to World War II veterans. In fact, memorials honoring Korean and Vietnam veterans were built and dedicated in far less time. But finally, in 2004, the National World War II Memorial was dedicated in Washington, D.C. And in 2009, the Central Missouri Honor Flight was started to allow mid-Missouri World War II veterans, including those from Fulton, an opportunity to see their national memorial at no cost. My son said, go, <laughs> dad, go. And once I went, it's, it's something that every veteran ought to do once they get the opportunity because it is such a worthwhile trip. It was a long day, but it was a great day. That trip itself will almost make you cry. Matter of fact, I think I did. The trip is essentially a 24-hour journey from mid-Missouri to Washington, D.C. and back. While the bus departs Columbia typically early in the morning, there was still enough time for people to show their respect for the veterans once they landed at Baltimore Washington International Airport. The Baltimore Airport has a two-story open space. We got in there, uh, they announced who we were. And everybody stopped what they were doing. Uh, the sailors greeted us, hand shook everybody. The people come over to the edge of the railing the upstairs and clapped and yelled and whistled. And you saw 82 guys with tears coming down their cheeks. I mean, I mean, it, it was, it was, made you proud to be an American. There were people there that would shake your hand, thank you for your service, which was something that we hadn't had even when we got home, you know, from the service. While in Washington, the veterans saw the changing of the guard at Arlington National Cemetery, the Vietnam Memorial, Korean War Memorial, Iwo Jima Memorial, and last but not least, their own memorial representing World War II. You meet them old guys, you know, you didn't know them, but, but you got well acquainted before you get back home. It's a fantastic place. Uh, there is a, they have these granite pillars there for each state. We spent uh, about three and a half, four hours at the memorial. And then we went to the uh, Vietnam Memorial and the uh, Iwo Jima Memorial. They took us out to, to the National Cemetery and uh, we got to see the changing of the guard. Once the sightseeing in the nation's capital was complete, it was time for the veterans to make their way home. But while on the flight from Baltimore to St. Louis, these men from the greatest generation experienced a moment they hadn't had in nearly 70 years. While we were on board the plane, they had gotten people from all around, and we had mail call. 
It is mail call time. You know the drill. Attention, please. Attention, please. We are having mail call. I said, mail call? I haven't heard of that since back when I was in the military. I have four great-grandchildren. And I had a letter from each of them. And the crew was so nice, seeing that everybody was recognized. It really got to me. The tugs on the veterans' heartstrings continued on the bus ride back to mid-Missouri as they entered the Kingdom of Callaway and the Kingdom City exit on Interstate 70. The group had company to guide them the rest of the way home. We had a motorcycle escort from Kingdom City to Columbia, and a lot of people were there to welcome us home, and it just turned out to be a beautiful day, something you'll never forget. It was a very great experience but it was a very humbling experience because I said I'd never been treated that nice by in my life. <laughs> it was the best thing that ever happened to us. And they, they took well care of us. And that was an honor. And that's the biggest honor we had because we didn't have nothing when we come on in. It's something that will help bring back some good memories, which it did. The honor flight was good. It was well, well worth the trip. The honor flight has allowed veterans to reflect on the events of 70 years ago and share their stories with others. Reliving those war years hasn't been easy, but the veterans have done so as proud yet humble Americans. I felt like I just did what my country called me to do. There wasn't anything that spectacular as far as I was concerned. I was lucky I came back alive. We thought it was our duty and we went. I served my country and I'm proud of it.